So it's a pleasure for me to um, be here. I think that when Joma comes to Chicago, it's always something of a homecoming because of the Crown Fountain, which was uh, realized in 2004. It has become a destination for people. It's become a landmark in this city. And it's also brought the nature of public art to a very high level. Um, and coming to um, Chicago and having 1,000 portraits of Chicagoans in 2004 for Crown Fountain, and then coming back 10 years later and adding four portraits to that um, for an exhibition in Millennium Park has been a significant part of Jaume's body of work and the trajectory of his work. He's most closely identified today with portrait heads, um, but in the 1980s and 1990s, his work um, really veered from uh, the portrait, and he incorporated inspiration from many different vanguard art movements, um, constructivism, surrealism, abstraction, and unusually for an artist, as artists often, not always, begin with figuration and move towards abstraction, Jaume's path has taken the opposite um, track. So what I want to start with today is a question that we usually think of how does um, an artist want the work to be perceived, but I'm wondering how you want viewers to come to this work and what what goals and ideas do you have for people who are coming to your sculpture um, to look at it? And do you think about that when you're making your work? Wow, it's a difficult question. Well, thank you. Thank you for yeah, being here. Of course. Uh, in the presentation that Jen did from Brooke, uh, they, she didn't say that she's a beautiful person. Thank you for coming. Uh, when I'm working, in my sculpture, I, I don't think about the public or the visitors. I guess uh, when I'm working in the public space, yes, a lot. I think it's two big uh, attitudes. In the studio, the studio is mine, the sculpture is mine. When I'm working in the public space, I think it's a completely different attitude. Well, that show, it's a, it's a dream. Uh, a personal dream. That is the reason that I call that uh, show Secret Garden. Uh, well, I always relate garden with the idea of grow, and, uh, and I guess all of us has a beautiful interior garden that is hidden to the others. And, and I love to think a lot about that, and many of those pieces are related to that. But when I create the pieces, honestly, I didn't thought about all of you. I was thinking about myself. In the way that, I guess, the beauty of art is that your dreams could be shared by others, but first you must to dream. And, uh, and that show is a, a personal dream that I guess could be shared by others. Because when you are going deeper inside your personal recalls, you are finding a very, a very uh, a big range of uh, fields that could embrace anyone because we are going to a certain common memory that uh, links us, all of us together. You talked about this piece in wood and how while you were realizing the work, um, the inner grain and the difference in color in the, in the surface of the material revealed itself. Please talk to us about this, this sculpture and what that process was for you. Well, since many years, um, as you know, I'm trying to what they could say that to fabricate or to produce or to reintroduce silence in our everyday life. I mean, I think for many reasons we are living in a very noisy time that is a lot of messages, information arriving to us and we don't know anymore if when we are talking, we are talking about ourselves or from our own ideas or we are just repeating as an echo of uh, the messages arriving to us. And I guess that the main reason is because we lose a little bit the concept of silence in our personal life, in the way that it's very hard to be alone with yourself. And many of those pieces, specifically that one, which has this 
very simple position that everybody could understand. It's the silence. Uh, but this is a position which is not an order. This, she's not saying, shut up. Mm -hmm. She's, I don't know, in an interior, very intimacy attitude of silence. Uh, that piece is carved on a beautiful kind of boot that I discovered. Uh, it's a boot coming from Cameroon, from Africa, and it's a very dense and heavy kind of boot that, as me, it does not float. Probably, uh, you probably remember, I talked many times about the Crown Fountain. Uh, it was a piece that I was dreaming to walk on the water because I don't swim, I could not float. And, and, and many times I, 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 I discover materials that is a certain, in a certain way, a, a kind of self-portrait as this kind of boot. It, does not, it doesn't float, okay? But I guess that is a beautiful concept because it seems a contradiction with boot. When you think about boot, you think that it's always floating. But some peculiar kind of boot don't, does not float. And, and that, I guess, is a beautiful metaphor about people also, that it seems that everyone looks the same, humanity, community, a lot, but every single person is unique. And, and, and I like in that case. I choose this kind of boot because it's completely different. And, uh, and, and this girl, which is a girl that I took the portrait a couple of years ago, is a girl from the Basque Country in the north of the Spain. And her name is Julia. And when I met her, she was 14 years old, I guess. I, 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 I really enjoy her attitude. She was a very special girl. And, and I guess it, that is also the reason to choose her for that space with the silence. I want to tackle the question of materials first. Um, these are portrait heads in stainless steel. When we think of stainless steel, you think of uh, Roxy Payne's stainless steel trees, um, Anish Kapoor's Cloud Gate in Millennium Park, very bright, um, sometimes brassy, um, reflective surfaces. These works have a velvet texture to the surface that's unanticipated from its material. So Jamé, tell us why you went to steel in the first place to make portrait heads. Also the scale of the work, um, how they are outsized, obviously. Um, and, and then that question of why choose steel if, um, why choose steel to become uh, a material somehow other than we consider, than we think of it typically? Well, actually, I'm working with stainless steel since 20 years, but in that kind of pieces. Right. And uh, with this laser cut leathers that I'm modeling around the shape. And uh, in that case, the pieces are cast in the stainless steel. But I, I never like it when stainless steel is polished and shiny. Mm -hmm. I, I feel a little bit banal. And, uh, but stainless steel has an amazing soul when it's a little bit in between of everything. And, and I guess I spent a little time to really catch this color, this, this uh, patina, which is a little bit like old silver. When, when the objects spend a lot of time uh, and, and, and you get this color which is, you don't know if it's due by time or what. what. And, 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 and also, my interest was to try to reach a certain group of drawings that I did two years ago with graphite. And, and, and the color, it seems sometimes that it's just a drawing on the space, which is graphite. And I guess that, that color or that material increase the certain sense of ethereal it seems that they lose the heaviness and it's just light and it's floating. And, uh, and, and those girls that uh, they are from very different origins and culture. Uh, this girl is from Sao Paulo, which is Isabella. This one is Carlota from Barcelona. This one is Laura, which is a Chinese girl from Madrid. The other one is a Chinese girl from Shanghai living in Canada. And the other one is a, a girl which is a, a living nearby my studio. All these different uh, origins 
has a certain direction, which is this idea of the int interiority, this idea of the, the close eyes. And, and this material is helping me to get a certain translucent or transparency in the piece. As you probably know, I'm working a lot with alabaster. Alabaster is a very a special kind of stone, which is translucent. And uh, in the other gallery, I have three heads in alabaster, which it seems that they have an inner light, that they are glowing themselves. And, and, and in those pieces, even if the material is really opaque, I, I, I think I catch that idea that is translucent, is transparent. It's almost floating in the space. And it helps this idea that I prefer to talk about the soul than the body. The figures are speaking uh, to one another in a sense. Did you plan for this way of installation of the, of the five works um, to be in the circle? Yeah, I guess uh, when, when uh, I try to do an installation, I, I give a lot of importance to where the pieces are facing or looking at. Mm -hmm. You probably notice in the entrance, when you go inside the gallery, you, you, you found the back side of the piece, <clears throat> which I think is great because you must to discover the other side. But it's also beautiful because the piece is giving you a direction, where the piece is looking at. And uh, in, in this circle, it seems that the wooden sculpture is the last one to close the circle in some ways. And, and, and also the positioning, it was something that spontaneously came up when we were installing. Uh, uh, Paul, Paul Gray is a great installer and, 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 and he helped me to do that circle because I guess the, one of the beauties of that show is also the scale. Uh, as a sculptor, I'm upset about the scale. I remember Anthony Caro, who was a beautiful British sculptor, when they told me, Jaume, is three main things in, in a sculpture, a scale, a scale, a scale. <laughs> and, uh, and he was right, and, uh, because for him probably the scale was in terms of size and measure and volume. For me the scale is also the soul of a piece which is expanding an energy all around. It's not necessarily a size, but is what kind of energy a piece is expanding to fill up the space. And I guess that show has the exactly scale for the space. I'm so pleased about that. And, and those girls making that circle, it seems that they have a certain conversation. And when people is in, in, in between, I think the piece is complete. It's a little bit like in the Crown Fountain. You probably remember when you walk through the water in between the two towers, the two faces, is when we are talking one to another and we create this amazing energy in between that it seems that it sucks everything around. And, and this circle is a little bit like that. It's a, it just communities, people, and when visitors are in, it seems that everything is complete. What about the question of that these works hover really between figuration and abstraction? If we can use two uh, old term words. When we were in the studio in Barcelona, you talked to me about how you were fascinated by the profile of some of the work, how the ears are almost like little landscapes. Um, I think that that shows enormous power in these, um, in these pieces. Well, uh, since many, well, since always, I have to say, I'm trying to embrace different contradictions in a sculpture. I'm trying to merge a sculpture with photography, for example, which I guess it seems part of different worlds. Photography is something uh, that catch the instant, and a sculpture, it seems always related to eternity, to so something that is, is, should be always there. I'm, I'm trying to merge with those portraits. You can feel that sense that sometimes it seems something virtual, okay. But also, how to catch a figure or figuration and abstraction. It's another of the main deals in my work, or trying to catch. Because uh, many times I've been talking that I grew up in a place where people was, uh, well, my parents loved to read books, and, and my main information was text. And I remember when, when I read uh, Shakespeare in the first time, it was Macbeth. And Macbeth has something which I, for me, is one of the most beautiful definitions of what a sculptor is, which when Macbeth killed the king, 
he realized that he didn't kill a man, a body, he killed the possibility to sleep. And, and, and it's great because when he said to sleep no more, it's because he really catch an abstraction, touching materials. He really killed the body of a man, but he killed the possibility to sleep. And I think a sculptor is very close about that because uh, we, we cannot describe, we, we are using volumes, shapes, you can touch uh, uh, the, the, the sculptors, but in any case you can describe. And, and, and we are embracing both. And, and those pieces that I'm, I'm playing a little bit with the volume, when you are in front of the piece, it seems the volume is complete, but when you are walking all around, the piece, it seems that disappear, 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 and you discover the backside of the sculpture. And because I, 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 I'm completely against the concept of frontality or the concept of volume, because the piece is, let's say, a container of energy. And when you are in the back, the ear, it just, as, as Brooke says, it's like a landscape with some shapes and becomes completely abstract. And, and, and I guess, well, it's beautiful when you think about people because many times uh, we are never the same depending on the light that touches or with whom we are. We are one or another. Uh, yesterday somebody said, touch me in the back. And when I turned, said, I'm sorry, I thought it was another person because my back apparently is exactly like the back of somebody else. And she has a surprise when I was, it was not him or, I don't know. I love that because I guess we have so much things in common. It, it's depending on the light, of the moment, of your eyes. And a sculptor should follow these feelings. And jean -May, I want to follow up on, you mentioned photography. You've said that um, an artist must use the tools of their time. Tell us about your use of, do you, could you have done these works before computer um, generated programs that enable scale in different ways? How does that figure into your work? And do you think of that as a tool of your time or, or not at all? Well, uh, it's very risky to make a confusion about the container and the, and the content, mm -hmm. okay? I think since the, the beginning of times, an artist is trying to talk about the same, the main questions. It's my idea. We are always asking ourselves who I am, where I'm going. I mean, what is the wall, what is right, what is wrong, I don't know. Light and darkness. But we are living in one specific time that gives us certain tools. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, and I'm using those tools in those cases. I'm, I'm, I'm scanning the heads. I'm, I'm working with the computer. I'm, I'm, I'm working with all the technology that I could get. But it's not because it's better. It's because I feel comfortable with that technique. In any case, it's impossible to hang a a, a drawing in the wall, beating the nail with the mouse. Okay, the mouse is great in the computer, but you cannot beat the nail on the wall with. Everything has a specific function. And in my studio, we use a hammer and we use the computer. The computer, in any case, uh, it, it is taking the place of a hammer. Everything is, fi is fine. And uh, because why? Because the shape is just a vehicle. The material is just a vehicle. Uh, a sculpture is not talking about volumes, it's not talking about uh, materials, it's talking about uh, energy, is my opinion. And, 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 and because I'm from the Mediterranean area, probably the way for me to express that is in that way. So you have made self-portraits um, since the 1980s, and you call this a self-portrait as well. Why is this a self-portrait? And does it come from um, your early interest as a child in your family life, where your um, parents, your father was especially um, erudite in poetry and literature, um, and that has been an enormous inspiration for you, even more than 
perhaps than looking at the work of other artists, um, poetry and literature has had a great impact on your work. So do you see yourself in this piece and in what way, or do you see yourself, some artists say that everything they do is a self-portrait, which is a cliche as well, but anyway, talk to us about that a little bit. No, everything I'm doing is not a self-portrait, um, but in that case, it's trying to imagine what a self-portrait could be in my case, and I guess it could, could be shared for, for many others. I, I guess I'm always dreaming to be with myself, which I think seems very easy, but it's very complicated. You maybe remember Peter Pan, he was a, a young boy flying around, and, and, and he was really upset, don't lose his shadow. And, uh, and I, think, I think it's one of the key in our life, is don't lose our shadow. And, 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 and it's this uh, crouching figure that becomes a sphere in itself, this kind of idea. The sphere is probably one of the most perfect geometrical shapes, which is uh, it's a projection of energy in some ways. And, and, and I love that uh, the figure is done by uh, different alphabets, and, and, and the sphere as well. It just the continuation, the projection of the same figure inside. And that for me is the ideal concept of uh, self-portrait, that you can see through the, the alphabets. Well, in this case, I'm using nine different alphabets, which is just a metaphor about diversity, how, how diverse is the world and how beautiful is that diversity. In that case, I'm using Tamil, I'm using uh, Hebrew, Arabic, Japanese, Chinese, uh, Cyrillic, uh, Greek, Hindi, and Latin. Well, nine different alphabets, could be others, but uh, it's just a metaphor about our world. And, and every single uh, letter or every single calligram, it's a little bit like the portrait of those girls, that they are talking about diversity as well. I mean, uh, I guess, uh, the, the, the way that we are writing, it's very similar as a musician when he's doing the partition of a sound, because our way to write, the text final is the partition of our music, which is the voice. When we are talking, we are making the music of our body. And when we are writing, we are making the partition of that. And I think it's a beautiful relationship with the idea of community also because a single letter seems nothing but together with another could do a war, a war with a war, a text, a text with a text, culture, etc. It's this beautiful concept from the smaller to the greatest. And I think text in some ways is a beautiful metaphor about community, about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Do you think of the letters in formal ways? Do you think of the shapes of these letters or does it go um, beyond that as, as well? What do you mean? In other words, the different alphabets, they have different formal characters. They look differently. Well, no, because they are coming from very different cultures. Uh -huh. I mean, and, and I, I think the, the, the best portrait of one culture is its alphabet. Right. I mean, how different is Chinese from Hebrew or, or, or Arabic from Greek? I mean, and I, I think it's talking about the background of one culture because we are evolving the alphabets for centuries until we really have the right graphism to express our way to be. If you would discuss the symbolism of the figure being encased in the globe, in the sphere. Well, I'm using the, this kind of posture and the way that is crouching or kneeling which I guess it's the most intimate way to be with yourself. Normally I'm using that posture, uh, or kneeling, both. And, um, and, and because it's a little bit like the same posture that you have when you are inside your mother, in some ways. Uh, I think it was a terrific moment, only nine months, but unforgettable nine months. When you are inside your mother, it's the best moment in our life, probably. I'd love to hear your thoughts about the early modernist desire to flatten the picture plane, particularly maybe another great Spanish artist that I'm thinking about, but how that desire fits into your approach to flattening the perspective of your sculpture and what it means to flatten a painting 
as opposed to changing the perspective of a sculpture. You mean because uh, my Mediterranean origin? Or I just, don't understand the question. Just as you view the sculpture, yes. it's flattening. Yeah. It's changing of perspective and dimension. Yeah, yeah. But that, that it's, as I told before, in the way that uh, how different we are in function than we, the position in that of the viewer. Uh, uh, I remember uh, that those pieces were born for a very funny thing, which was looking always a coin. Uh, I always miss the other side of the face. You know, normally it's a face in the coin. And, and you see how this face looks from the other side. Because when you look at the face, it seems the volume is complete. Uh, but the other side. And I did something similar with, you probably remember my curtains of poetry, because I was upset what's happened with the other side of one letter when we are reading in a paper and you see the letter A, B, C, how the back side of the letter looks like because they are always uh, stick it on the wall, which is the paper. And I like it to, to make a, a liberation of the letters from the paper. And I start to do my curtains with poetry that people have the possibility to th pass through. Okay. In that case, it's similar. I mean, the, the volume is something that it's sometimes just a perception. And, and, and when you are in front of the faces, you, you feel it's complete. And the thing I did was to, to really compress that, that volume uh, as much as possible. I was trying, 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 trying. And, 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 and it's funny because it, it, it's fantastic because when, when you are in front of the piece, you feel it's complete, but when you are walking around, it seems it's disappearing. I, I don't know where that idea comes from, honestly, but uh, I mean, uh, you probably remember in the Crown Fountain, I, I've been elongating the heads and scratching because I wanted to have 1,000 portraits, but all of them in the same, let's say, spirit. And uh, obviously, I put the mouth always in the same place, where it was the gargoyle, the nozzle, and then the eyes in the same place as well. And all the portraits get something in common, with, with something was not anymore one specific person. Uh, it was like an icon of all of us. Okay, with those pieces, I'm trying to do something similar. In the way that you are compressing the volume, scratching the volume in that way, it seems that they lose weight. And, 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 and they become much more abstract, and that which uh, she was talking about it. Why doesn't this one have a face or a belly? The bronze one? This one. Ah, this one has no face? It's empty. Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> the arms are, are uh, connected, but uh, I'm keeping also many times completely open, because I guess it's a piece that uh, should be complete, it's not complete, it's unfinished. And, 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 and you probably will put a different face than I will put, you know? And that's it, that's a little bit. So my question is about the beginning and the end, and your concept, and it comes to you. Then at the end, when it's complete, when you finish the piece, do you have the same feelings, whether they're passionate or excited or joyful? Are they the same? I remember, for, for example, with the Crown Fountain, as far as we are in Chicago, we can talk about it. Uh, the first sketches that I did, uh, uh, people were uh, really wondering when they said the piece, when they seen the piece finish, because it was exactly. And it was working probably 200 people in that project around me to, to build up that. But uh, we control, you know? And, uh, but in this kind of pieces, you must to follow the piece as well. I mean, obviously, I could say that uh, the wooden sculpture, for example, when you are carving the trunk, you have not any idea that it will be something so beautiful waiting for you as these dark veins on the face. That when, when, when that happens, it's, a, it's a, wow, it's amazing. But you have not any idea, you are just working. The boot is alive, it's organic. I mean, you never know. Or when I'm working with a stone, marble, or alabaster, or, or basalt stone, you, you are opening something, a surprise, okay? And, uh, and you must to follow the materials also. Uh, you could not impose 
your ideas. You must to create a frame in where the material helps you to grow up with you and to create something unique and special. And many times I'm the first surprise. Many times I should just drop the garbage, the peas. But when something is good and happens, it's an amazing moment. I think the best moment for an artist, probably. I was wondering, in this assemblage of um, vocabulary and uh, that, that you have connected together, is there a hidden message that's beyond just your self-portrait? Often artists have something that's hidden in the piece. The, the letters are random. Okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, my intention, well, probably it's a hidden message, but I don't know. I didn't find yet. Okay. Uh, in any case, my intention is not to say something or the piece is a message in itself, uh, in the way that uh, how well we are when we are together. Uh, because all this diversity creates an amazing dynamic feeling. And, uh, and that's the message, it's nothing behind. No, 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 no. I mean, every one of us could read different things. And, um, and, and every single letter or calligram or alphabet has something unique because it's part of the background of one culture. And I guess that is the message, the presence of the text. And take it in that way, it's almost something that I like to think like a biologist, you know, it's the cell of our uh, ideas, it's the cell of a text is the leather. A leather alone seems nothing, you know? but it's full up of memory also. I mean, it, and that is the message. Are these pieces all solid? No, they're hollow. Yeah, so they're hollow inside. Yeah, thanks God, this is still possible. So, <laughs> yeah, unless you, you did. No, the, 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 it technically is like the uh, a bronze cast piece, but cast in uh, stainless steel. Oh, cast in stainless steel. Yeah. Okay. Is there any reference to you, the um, early dynastic um, Egyptian figures that sit crouched up? I'm not sure what they, and their knees to their chin, with as well as a personal holding there. I mean, I, you have an art historical reference to that, the sitting. Figure. Well, you know, uh, with, the, with the calligraphy on the carved into the basalt of the rock. Yeah, well, uh, um, I was born in the 20th century. It means <laughs> oh, that. Well. No, 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 but that, I mean, it's 20 centuries before me, people working. I suppose something, I have something in the back, in a certain memory. Uh, m many people said, looks like a Buddha. You said, looks like an Egyptian. Somebody said, no, it looks like an Olmec head. And others said, I love that because it means that we are in the right track. In the way that it means that everyone make associations because I guess the most beautiful is how diverse is from the Egyptian piece, not how close it is, you know. And but it's iconic. Yeah, but uh, I, uh, I don't remember an uh, uh, Egyptian piece in that position. Uh, the text maybe, but the There's text... Crouching, sitting feet, I can't give you the name of the city. No, feet, no, they have city. the Escriba. Escriba, which was the name of this guy who was writing papers. It was kneeling, but it's fine. It doesn't matter. No, never a Buddha sit in that position. And people yeah. said, look, it looks like a Buddha. OK, a Buddha never sits like that. Uh, I mean, why? Because all of us are taking the same positions, the same postures. and. Um, and, and I love, I love, for example, from the Egyptian concept, the repetition. In, in that show, it's not exactly described in that way. I did in many other shows to repeat the same shape several times because it creates a beautiful harmony. And uh, that is very present in many primitive cultures also, the repetition of the same. It creates a certain kind of uh, uh, harmony that makes you think something much higher than you. Yeah, wonderful little one outside of Gray's uh, gallery on Michigan Avenue, the guy straddles a, a tree. Yeah, yeah. Well, that is part of my work also, which is my self-portrait embracing a tree. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and that is coming from the concept of al alchemist. Alchemist was a, a group of people in the medieval time that was dreaming about well, more popular, they said, to pass lead into gold. 
but it was just in a spiritual attitude. It was w wonderful because they, they said from the death body, from the death materials, from the mineral, a new life is coming up and the shape of that new life is in, in the shape of a tree. And, and, and the tree has the roots on the death material, the trunk is like a bridge and the branches embrace the cosmos. Mm -hmm. That was the beautiful concept of alchemy. And, and I, I always was dreaming about that. And, and, and I finally decided to do my self-portrait cast in bronze with a, a real tree inside me. What's happened? Because when we are growing, our shape gets in a certain size, in a certain volume, in a certain dimension. But what's happened with our recalls? Where our soul has the room to be because we accumulate experiences, experiences. But my body has not the size enough for all this information. <laughs> and, and, and that is the tree. The tree continues to grow. And, 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 and I have already several uh, 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 figures with trees. I have one at home. It was my first one that I keep in my garden to, to check what's happened with. And the trunk, it's taking the space. And, and, and in the one in my, in my uh, garden is already taken it up because the trunk fill up completely the interior space and my face is almost disappearing in the trunk already. That is the beauty of that piece, you know? And, and, and it's this idea of death and the life materials. I'm, I'm talking about the, an, another contradiction that I was mentioning before in the sculpture, no, not describing abstract, figurative, you know, death, alive. And I think that it's part of my work. You seem to have such an ethereal macro vision worldview and it almost seems to transcend culture and transcend civilization, and I'm just curious, you spoke a lot about literary references and, and things that you've read, but I'm just curious, as far as your upbringing, what other influences do you accredit that to? Um, did you travel a lot? Did you study religions? It just, it's very amazing and humbling simultaneously, so thank you for being with us. The, the beauty of uh, art, it's because everything is information, everything. Even your ghost or your problems becomes material with, to work. I think it's a, it's a fantastic job. You don't need a psychologist or psychiatrist. You don't need nothing. Everything is part of your material. And, uh, and uh, uh, the beautiful William Blake, the poet, said something that I guess he was right. He said, one thought feels immensity. This idea that your vibrations as, you, as a person fill up the space with energy. And I guess a sculpture has this tremendous capacity to awake the objects that probably got to sleep in somewhere. And, and that I think art has a lot to do in that way, just to awake the things around.